good morning all in today's webinar we will be discussing about neonatal cessation our outline for today's webinar includes the background of neonatal cessation the algorithm for neonatal cessation the recent updates as per the recent publications and what are the various med medications which are used for neonatal cessation and finally the cpr training to achieve best possible neonatal outcomes the most crucial period for a neonate is at the time of birth that is the period of transition because the babies they make a transition from fetal to neonatal life that is they shift from a fluid filled space to an air filled space although majority of the neonates make this transition smoothly around 10% of the babies require some help and only 1% of these neonates require intensive resuscitation in the form of post pressure ventilation endotracheal intubation chest compression and drug administration therefore each delivery should be attended by at least one person who is skilled to provide post pressure ventilation remember to achieve best possible outcome for neonates neonatal resuscitation requires training preparation and teamwork the essential components for neonatal resuscitation includes the guidelines which are based on proper science and evidence the effective education of resuscitation providers that training and finally and the most crucial step that is implementation of effective and timely resuscitation in this algorithm the resuscitation starts usually with antenatal counseling and team team briefing team briefing is done prior to the event to get prepared and decrease the chance of failure and also it is important to check equipment and make an equipment checklist before going for the resuscitation the three questions which are asked at the birth can be remembered by the mnemonic of ttn that is whether the baby is term gestation or not whether he has good tone or not and whether there is normal breathing or crying if the answer to these three questions is yes then the baby goes to the mother for skin to skin contact and is monitored for temperature color and breathing however if the answer to these any of these three questions is no then the baby has to be taken to the resuscitation corner he has to be positioned properly his airway have to be cleared of secretions and he has to be dried and stimulated if the neonate continues to be have apnea or is having gasping respiration or heart rate is below 100 per minutes the positive pressure ventilation has to be started along with attachment of an pulse oximeter if the heart rate remains below 100 then the correct steps have to be taken place and one may consider endotracheal intubation if despite 30 seconds of effective positive pressure ventilation the heart rate remains below 60 per minutes then the chest compressions have to be started remember at the time of chest compressions you have to increase the oxygen delivery to 100% and one can consider putting an umbilical lines because the child may require administration of drugs or fluid bolus and also one should consider attachment of ecg for accurate and rapid assessment of heart rate if it has not been done previously and if despite giving effective post pressure ventilation and chest compression the heart rate remains below 60 per minute then one should consider giving iv epinephrine for any baby who has labored breathing or cyanosis the baby should be started on cpap at the time of birth and any baby who requires resuscitation should be shifted to nicu for post resuscitation care and finally after each resuscitation team debriefing is to be done team debriefing is done after the event to do reflective learning that is to learn from the mistakes and in order to prevent such mistakes in the future now delayed cord clamping has been a norm for all stable term and preterm babies in term babies delayed cord clamping has been shown to increase hemoglobin at 24 to 48 hours of life also these term babies 
have increased iron stores in the form of serum ferritin at three to six months of life. Although delayed cord clamping has been shown to increase the incidence of polycythemia in term babies, however, the need for phototherapy was shown to be same in both the early cord clamping and delayed cord clamping groups. In preterm babies, the advantages are even more than the term babies. It has been shown that dead cord clamping decreases the need for inotropes, blood transfusions, preterm neonates. Also, it decreases mortality in preterm neonates. Some of the studies have even shown that it decreases necrotizing enterocolitis. All healthy term babies should be kept in skin to skin contact at the time of birth to ensure euthermia, euglycemia, and also initiate breastfeeding. Remember that not only hypothermia, but also hyperthermia can be harmful for the babies. Therefore, both should be prevented. Whenever the babies require positive pressure ventilation, for any baby who is more than 35 weeks of gestation, positive pressure ventilation should be started with room air. This is because when a study compared room air with 100% oxygen, the babies who received 100% oxygen, they had increased short-term mortality, although there was no difference in long-term new development outcome among the survivors. For preterm babies who are less than 35 weeks, we usually start between 21 to 30% of FI2 for positive pressure ventilation. This is because the studies uh, have shown that less than 50% FI2 and more than 50% FI2, there was no difference. Therefore, we start with the lower FI2 in order to prevent damage because of the hyperoxia. Also, in other study, all preterm babies required a fire of up to 30% to achieve saturation targets. Also, whenever a baby receives positive pressure ventilation or a baby is on oxygen, he should be attached to pulse oximeter to monitor the saturation levels to prevent both hypoxia as well as hyperoxia. Remember that routine oral laser or orophageal suctioning is no more recommended and should be avoided because it leads to vagal stimulation and can lead to bradycardia and apnea. Whenever a baby is born, one has to keep warm chain into mind in order to promote hypothermia and it usually starts with skin to skin care at the time of birth and all the procedures such as post pressure ventilation, endotracheal intubation, chest compression should be done under radiant warmer. And for preterm babies, one can consider a combination of use of warmer plastic wraps, increased labor room temperature, and providing warm and humidified gases. Although exothermic mattress has been shown to decrease incidence of hypothermia, their use has been also shown to increase the hyperthermia. And for resource limited settings, one can consider food grade plastic bag and swaddling to prevent hypothermia. Remember that in mucon aspiration, the routine endotracheal suctioning is no more recommended. And endotracheal suctioning in case of muconium aspiration syndrome or babies born out of muconium stained amniotic fluid should only be considered when there is visible obstruction in babies receiving positive pressure ventilation. In short, now there is no difference between resuscitating a baby born out of muconium staining amniotic fluid and other babies. The best assessment of effective positive pressure ventilation is done by assessment of heart rate and auscultation remains the preferred method. Although ECG is the more accurate method possible, but its availability is not possible at all places, especially in developing countries. When compared to pulse oximetry, ECG is more rapid and more accurate, especially in the initial few minutes after life. However, ECG does not replace the need for pulse oximetry to evaluate oxygen saturation. However, one should consider placement of ECG for rapid and accurate assessment of heart rate during chest compression. The indication for positive pressure ventilation is whenever the heart rate is less than 100 beats per minute or unit is having inadequate respiration or apnea. The rate usually is between 40 to 60 per minute and peak inspiratory pressure up to 30 centimeters of water should be considered in term babies and up to 20 to 25 centimeters of water in preterm babies. One should avoid 
excessive pressures because excessive pressures have been shown to be associated with increased lung and brain injury and the best measure of effective ventilation is rise in heart rate also babies who require positive pressure ventilation the babies should be started on pwp to establish frc that is functional rest joel capacity and prevent atelectrotrauma remember that risk of death or prolonged admission increases by 16% for every 30 second delay in initiating post pressure ventilation also one has to remember that the routine use of sustained inflation to initiate resuscitation in preterm neonates is harmful and should not be performed in one of the largest rcts it was shown that sustained inflation in babies less than 28 weeks is associated with increased mortality and the trial had to be stopped moving on to the chest compression chest compression should be considered whenever the heart rate is below 60 per minute despite 30 seconds of adequate and effective post pressure ventilation it is usually administered in synchrony with inflation and for each three chest compressions there has to be one inflation the total events in one minute are 120 that is 30 inflations and 90 compressions in one minute there are two techniques of administrating just chest compression one is the two thumb technique in which we encircle the chest and provide chest compression with two thumbs and other is the two finger technique it has been shown in smaller studies that two thumb technique is better than the two finger technique two thumb technique ensures better blood pressure and also less operator fatigue remember that all preterm babies who have respiratory distress at birth should be started on cpap rather than on invasive ventilation in the meta analysis when the researchers compared cpap at birth with invasive mechanical ventilation cpap group was associated with lower incidence of combined outcome of bpd or death and the number needed to benefit was 25 so cpap is both safe as well as effective for umbilical access the umbilical vein is the preferred route and one should place an umbilical venous catheter to the level whenever there is a free flow of blood that is the low position is preferred and if for some reasons the intravenous access is not feasible or possible and depending on the expertise available for the equipment intraoperative route can be considered medication should be considered whenever the heart rate is less than 60 per minute despite 60 seconds of effective chest compression and adequate post pressure ventilation and the drug used is epinephrine in a dose of 0.01 to 0.3 mg per kg and while the vascular access is being obtained one may consider giving endotracheal epinephrine in relatively larger doses however as soon as the vascular access is obtained one should repeat an iv dose of adrenaline if there is in history of blood loss or examination is suggest of blood loss one can consider volume expansion by giving 0.9% saline at a dose of 10 to 20 ml per kg over 10 to 20 minutes one can also repeat dose of adrenaline every 3 to 5 minutes if there is inadequate response usually more than 3 doses is not recommended because excessive administration of adrenaline has been shown to be associated with hypertension and tachycardia for late preterm and term babies who have moderate to severe hi that is hypoxemic ischemic encephalopathy therapeutic hypothermia should be considered under strict protocols and follow up plans therapeutic hypothermia is now the treatment of choice for hi and it has been shown to decrease the incidence of mortality and major neurodevelopment disability at 18 months of life there has been it has been shown that therapeutic hypothermia decreases the combined outcome of mortality and neurodevelopment disability by almost 25% all babies who receive prolonged post pressure ventilation or advanced resuscitation should be shifted to an icu for post resuscitation care 
and these babies are prone to have hypo and hyperglycemia and both hypo and hyperglycemia can lead to impaired neural development outcome in such babies therefore they should be vigorously monitored for hypo and hyperglycemia and treatment should be instituted accordingly now when to withhold or discontinue resuscitation for all units who require resuscitation if there is no heart rate at the end of 20 minutes period of resuscitation one can consider cessation of resuscitation after discussing with the family and withholding resuscitation has to be individualized and it depends on the family's opinion availability of the advanced neonatal care like hypothalamic hypothermia also one can withhold resuscitation at birth if there are extreme prematurity usually the extremes of viability varies from country to country usually it is taken between 22 to 25 weeks depending on the country and or if there are serious congenital malformations which are known to be incompatible with life or known to be associated with severe neural functional outcome one can consider withholding the cessation at birth hypothermia is temperature less than 36 degrees celsius and should be prevented and if it is there it should be corrected as soon as possible both rapid and slow rewarming have been shown to be effective and there is no difference between the two methods remember that hypothermia is associated with increased morbidity in the form of brain injury hypoglycemia and respiratory distress but it also increases the mortality it has been shown that cr that cpr training skills decay by 3 to 12 months and therefore frequent booster training should be done to improve neonatal outcomes and in some of the studies it has been shown that frequent booster trainings have been shown to improve neonatal resuscitative outcomes therefore one should not rely on the previous norm that is one used to get trained every two yearly now one should at least try to get trained every 3 to 6 monthly in order to ensure better outcomes thank you